Hello, everyone. My name is moderator Kate. I am part of the American English for Educators Facebook page team, and we're here today live for our first session in the teacher development series, creating a positive classroom community. Thanks so much for your patience. We had a little bit of technical difficulty, but we're back again and we're ready to share with you all of the teaching and learning strategies related to creating a classroom community that our presenter Mari Bodensteiner is going to share with us today. So we have our moderator today, John Mark King, who's going to be facilitating from Washington, D.C. in the Office of English Language Programs. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and give the mic over to you, John Mark, and we'll go ahead and get started. Great. Thank you, moderator Kate. I'm very happy to be here today. Welcome, everyone, to the very first session in our exciting new series, American English Live Teacher Development. We're very, very happy to have you here. As Kate said, my name is John Mark King. I'm uh, here in Washington, D.C. at the Office of English Language Programs, and I'm a member of our enigmatic American English social media team, and um, super happy to be your facilitator and host today. So welcome, welcome. Let's, uh, let's begin with uh, a look at this great photo that shows English teachers participating in American English professional development. Uh, we love to see teachers learning and exchanging ideas. As a teacher myself, it's one of my favorite things to do too. Uh, if you have photos like this of a viewing session, uh, please email them to us at AmericanEnglishWebinars at ELprograms.org. You can see the uh, email address right there on the slide. We want to hear from you. Um, so let's now take a look at our schedule for the series. Um, you can see we have a great lineup of presenters and topics throughout. This month, we're focusing on creating a positive classroom community, which is the topic of our session today. Uh, in February, next month, we'll explore topics that are related to our upcoming eTeacher Massive Open Online course, uh, which focuses on critical thinking and culture. More information about that coming up. Then in March, we're going to look at getting students moving and active in the classroom. So we look forward to seeing uh, you for all of our sessions, which are at 8 a.m. or 1 p.m. Eastern time from Washington, D.C. And they're broadcast right here on the American English for Educators Facebook page. So a little bit of information about what to expect. Our sessions are 60 minutes long each, uh, depending on how much talking I do. As mentioned before, uh, each of them is related to an American English Teacher's Corner theme or to an e-teacher massive open online course. You can participate in the session by responding to the questions that, that we present or making comments um, in the section underneath this post. We're going to do our best to respond uh, to as many of you as we can during the session, but feel free to include your first name and uh, where, your country when you reply so that we can give you a shout out to when we read your question. So this is really exciting. We want to officially announce that American English is launching its uh, second e-teacher massive open online course or MOOC for English language teachers. So this one is called integrating critical thinking into the exploration of culture in an EFL setting. It's a long title, I know, sorry. Uh, but it presents participants with a working definition of culture and tools for analyzing, understanding, and negotiating differences between uh, cultures. Participants in this MOOC, they explore what critical thinking is, why it's necessary for the development of intercultural competence. So with a view towards preparing teachers to implement culture and critical thinking lessons into their current teaching contexts, participants in this MOOC, they work through a lot of different examples of related activities and lesson plan elements, as well as ways of evaluating students' progress in these areas. And if you earn 70% or higher, you'll receive a digital badge, which is like an electronic certificate, as a mark of completion. So this free online course, and I mean free as in it costs nothing, starts on February the 19th. So for more information and to register for free, visit aeeteacher.org slash mooc. You can see it right here on the slide. Please, please sign up. 
All right, now I wanna talk about digital badges, which I mentioned before, are kind of like electronic certificates. This is really, really neat stuff. So um, after today's session, you have the opportunity to receive your own digital badge. So when our presenter, Mari, has completed the, her presentation, we're going to share with you a link. You click on that link and you can take a very short, relatively easy quiz uh, for you to receive your digital badge. So there'll be three multiple choice questions. Um, and what you have to do is get two of the three correct. And uh, then you receive your badge. Now you can only in enter your information one time. So please take your time and make sure that you read each question carefully. And within about a week, you'll receive your badge by email from American English at state.gov. If you want to find out more about participating in viewing groups in your region with other English teachers like you, please contact your local regional English language office or uh, your nearest U.S. embassy or consulate. All right, so now for information about today's presentation, which we're very excited about. Uh, it's called Creating a Positive Classroom Community. So successfully fostering relationships among learners creates a sense of purpose and a sense of belonging in the classroom. And this results in greater student participation and rapport. During today's session, our presenter, Mari, will share examples of successful classroom community building activities, strategies, and techniques to implement not only on the first day of school, but throughout the year. And by the end of this session, you will have multiple activities that can be easily implemented into your own classroom in order to build a positive classroom learning community. So right away at the end of the session today, you have something to use in the classroom. So now I wanna introduce Mari Bodensteiner, today's presenter. She was an English language fellow in Laos, and there she taught professional communication skills to government officials, and she also mentored university English teachers. She received her Master of Education from Western Washington University with an emphasis in adult education. Her interests and her expertise include curriculum and program development, peer mentoring programs, and presentation skills training. Mari strives to create an effective learning atmosphere for all learners using authentic and communicative practices in her classroom. So, I introduced you just now, Mari. Welcome, it's great to have you. How are you today? Thank you. Hi, John Mark. It's, I'm doing very well. It's a nice day. I'm coming from uh, Bellingham, Washington. So I'm on the opposite coast as you. I'm in the okay, so west coast of the United States. You're on the west coast. I'm on the east coast, but it's, yep. uh, it's, uh, the internet is amazing. It's like you're right here. I know, just like all of our participants are coming in from all over the world. Huh? I know. Well, should we be shouting because it's so far? Can you hear me okay? <laughs> I, think, I think, can you hear me all right? I, yeah, pretty, pretty much. Good. Okay, I'll let you know. I can open my window <laughs> if that helps. <laughs> I don't think I'd make it all the way over there, but okay. I'll speak up. <laughs> all right, so I'll stop talking and you go right ahead. Great, yeah. Well, thank you for the introduction. Like John Mark said, my name is Mari Bodensteiner. And I'm going to be talking today about creating a positive classroom community. Um, before I begin, I'm curious where all of our participants and educators are viewing from. So if you want to continue just saying your name and country, we can see them coming in on the comment box there. Um, as John Mark had said that I have recently lived in Southeast Asia, living in Laos, um, while serving as an English language fellow. Um, and I've taught in many settings, ranging from preschool students to adult learners. And so what I'm going to share today are different strategies and activities that I've used for all age levels of English language learners. Um, um, in any classroom I teach, I really try and create an effective learning atmosphere for all learners, um, whether they're young students or adult learners. And I try and use authentic and communicative practices in the classroom. And in my experience, um, I've established a few strategies and activities that have proven to be most effective um, in developing a positive classroom community, which uh, I will share with you today. Um, so I'm so excited to be here. And just this American English live event is a great virtual example of a community of educators participating and learning together. Um, we've had really great comments in our 
American English webinar Ning page and as well as the Facebook Live page, the American English for Educators Facebook page. Um, so I just want to share a few things that people have already been saying about communities. Um, Ms. Bahia Nasiva said, even though we live in different parts of the world, we have the same feelings, problems, and achievements, but community, in her understanding, is a group of people with the same interests and goals. So we're going to try and use some activities to find those similar interests and goals within our students so they can begin to build that community in our classroom. Um, so, John Mark, who do you see? Do we have some participants from around the world? Yeah, we're seeing a couple of comments from uh, participants in China. Wow, they, they're right. up really late. I hope they don't have to teach yeah. them. <laughs> Because those uh, that's going to be tough. Like if you have to be a in class at eight o'clock in the morning and it's after midnight, I guess it's incumbent upon us to do a great job today. Yes, that's dedication. So thank you. I really appreciate all of the participants taking time and participating in these teacher development series. That's great. Great. Uh, moving to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about what I will do in the next uh, forty-five minutes here. Um, three goals, three things that we will end with would be defining the classroom communities, what that means and what that means to your classroom. Understanding the importance of a positive classroom community. And also I'm going to share strategies and activities to build a classroom community. And like John Mark had mentioned earlier, some of these activities um, you might be able to implement in that 8 a.m. class tomorrow if you're staying up late and viewing now. So thank you. I can say that we, uh, we have lots of participants uh, from Afghanistan, from Iraq, great. and from Latin America as well. That's great. That's so great. I'm so happy there are so many great educators out there uh, participating in this series. So please continue making comments throughout. Um, I'll be asking a few questions, um, and I'd love to hear some responses uh, as we continue. Um, before I begin, I just want to talk about why classroom communities are so important to me. Um, I've shared a few pictures of my own classrooms here. When I first began teaching, I really struggled to find a good balance in my classroom of teaching enough content as well as making sure my students were really well-rounded uh, individuals and growing and achieving their own goals. Um, if you come into my classroom at any time, it's usually very active. I implement a lot of learning activities that encourage students to engage and discuss and share with each other. Um, and I promote a lot of movement in my classroom. And I understand that can be a uh, constraint for some people with uh, large class sizes or small classrooms. Um, but I use a lot of group work as well. And I'm gonna talk about some of those strategies that we can use when we do have those constraints. Um, as you can see in this photo, I have students working together at the whiteboard. I'm using post-its. I have them taking notes um, in their own notebook, sharing and discussing. Um, it, it takes a lot of work on the end of the teacher to build this kind of rapport and getting all of my students engaged and working together. And so, like I said, I'm going to share some activities of what I've done prior to these photos to build that community. Um, so I, I'd like to ask some audience participants before I uh, discuss this next photo, if you could describe your classroom. Um, what would it be? What would be one word to describe your classroom? So if you want to answer mm -hmm. that in the Facebook comments, um, that would be great. I'd love to hear some of those words that describe your classroom. Um, in this next photo here, I have students dancing. Um, I taught a, if we want to go to the next slide, that would be great. Um, I taught a really early 7.30 a.m. thesis writing course in Laos. Um, and my students, one day I came to class ready to teach and my students were already there. They were already ready to learn. And I had um, asked what they were doing. I was wondering if I had missed a meeting or assembly and they just decided to get up even extra early, meet together. Um, it was Lao wedding season. And so they were practicing the traditional Lao dances, mm. um, which was great. And you could see that rapport that they had or those relationships that they had together um, wanting to work together in dancing um, and practicing for wedding season. So, this is great. Well, mm -hmm. so um, 
I see that they're all dressed the same. Was that just an accident? They're like, oh no, we all decided to wear blue on the same day. How embarrassing. <laughs> yep, that was our uh, school uniform. Oh, okay, I get it. Well, we're, uh, we're getting some uh, responses from the, um, from our viewers about describing that class, their, their classroom with one word. Great. Um, Ahmed El Ghadri uses the word motivated. Great. Um, Suhail Aziz, fun. I want to be in, the, in that classroom. Um, let's see. Alma says, my class is usually active. Um, Maria says, uh, multicultural. That's cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Serena says, uh, communication. Great. Nice. Yes. And as English language learners, we want our students to be confident in the classroom. And so we want them, you know, we want to strive for those, those great words that every teacher there is using to describe. Um, with all this in mind, though, I want to just reiterate the fact that it does take intentional planning on the teacher. Um, we don't always have a perfect classroom, you could say. We don't always have every student there wanting to learn or engaged. And so if we can begin building those connections, we can start building that community to connect all of our students together in the classroom. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, looking at our next slide, moving on, classroom community. Um, what does community mean? And for all of our participants, what does community mean to you? How do you describe that? Mm. Mark, what does community mean to you? Well, what does community mean to me? I would say the community means like a place or a group of people that um, they work together, they know each other, they rely on each other, maybe they know what their responsibilities are. That's, uh, that's what I think. Yeah, and, and I'm a part of different communities. I have um, different communities that I've involved in where I live, uh, my work community, I have colleagues that I collaborate with. Um, I am a part of a swim team, and so my teammates are part of my community. Um, but we're going to be specifically talking about our classroom community and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, in our pre-discussion on our Facebook page, Mr. Tariq Mumi said that students should feel accepted and individuality is encouraged. Um, where creating this kind of classroom community requires planning and practice and guiding students to participate in class meetings to work collaboratively, which I really liked his um, thoughtful response there. Yeah, I have a few also from our current viewers. Um, Sesame says, a group with great understanding and solidarity. Solidarity is a great word. Great. Uh, let's see, Shabrina says, a group of people sharing the same goal. Uh, let's see, uh, Rania says, individuals existing together. Existence is always good. Good, yeah. Um, uh, Gilmar says a group of people with some common interest. I think all of these definitions have a, have a very common theme. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, and, and in terms of community, I want uh, the teachers participating here to think about um, in the next, for the rest of the session, how are you intentional about uh, creating these relationships and establishing a community in your own classroom? And we will return to that question towards the end of the webinar, but just thinking about as I share these strategies, are you already doing some of these or what are you doing in your classroom uh, to build these relationships with your students? Um, to define community, um, we want to be intentional about this classroom community and defining that in our classroom. In terms of the word community, many people say they know it when they see it, but it can be difficult to explain. And so I think that uh, Dr. Elfie Cohn has a strong definition of the term. In his book, Beyond Discipline, From Compliance to Community, he describes a classroom community as a place in which students feel cared about and are encouraged to care, and are encouraged to care about each other. Um, they experience a sense of being valued and respected. They connect to each other. The students matter to one another and to the teacher and they become a part of an us. The focus moves away from I or me um, and individuality into becoming part of an us um, and a we in our learning um, journey in the classroom. So students care about, they feel valued and respected, they connect, they matter, and they're part of a we, uh, a community here. And I think that when, when I do have a smaller classroom, maybe 20 students or less, 
um, it's evident once you have that community. If a student's absent, your, your class knows who's absent um, and, and they're concerned or worried about where that student is because they matter to each other and they care about them. Uh, and I think it's important that as a teacher, we show respect to our students and the students share respect to each other. Um, so that's the definition that we're gonna work with. Um, what do you think, Denmark? Would you add anything else to that definition? No, I think I like this definition a lot. In, in particular, um, feeling like you're connected to each other. Yeah. As you're yeah. part of a group that has its own identity. Great, definitely. Um, so these next four strategies I'm going to talk about um, are strategies that I implement on the first day of class. I feel they're most effective when they're implemented very early on in the school year. However, um, if you are in the middle of your school year, you still could implement some of these, um, and I've found that to be effective as well. And so um, going to our very first strategy here, I want to talk about the importance of a name and the importance of each of your students' names and the power that a name has and using that name in the classroom. Um, your name can equate to your identity. Um, personally, I have a very long name, uh, especially as an American. My name is Mary Frances Marie Lyons Bodensteiner. It's a long name and I love my name, but it's confusing, especially because I go by Mari, but my name is Mary Frances and my middle name's Marie. And so they all kind of sound alike. Has anyone participating, has anyone ever mispronounced your name? Um, I feel like that's maybe pretty common, especially oh, name? any names, any of the oh. participants viewing. Right, yeah, my yeah. name's pretty common to pronounce <laughs> yeah. <that> name. <laughs> um, But I feel like too, in a language classroom, uh, sometimes we're learning new names or new languages that can be difficult. Um, I always kind of dreaded the first day of school as a kid, just because I had such a struggle with the teacher, kind of that back and forth, trying to correct the teacher with my pr correct pronunciation. And they would try and correct me saying my name was Mary, but I would say Mari and it sounds so similar. Um, and so I really wanted to avoid that unnecessary um, negativity that I felt as a kid in my own classrooms. And so what I do on the first day of school is I create nameplates. And so you can see in this picture of this classroom here, um, where the arrows are pointing, I just have a piece of computer paper folded in half and I have the students write their own name. And instead of me reading the uh, roster or the class list, I have students introduce themselves to me um, so that I can hear them using their correct pronunciation. Um, as I'm leaving class, I even have students with their permission, of course, uh, filming them holding their nameplate so I can read it and saying it. So then I can go home and practice. And that's kind of my own homework for the first day of school practicing. Um, this was especially useful when I was living in Laos, being unable um, or learning a new language and new tones in Lao and being able to uh, correctly pronounce my students' names. Mm. Um, and so with this role, uh, with the nameplates, there are different strategies I like to use. If we go to this next slide here, um, you can see no matter the size of the class, I always have students using, uh, I always have students using those nameplates. Um, and it's not just for me as a teacher, but it's also so that the students start using each other's names in the classroom um, where they can feel a sense of connection and ownership in that classroom. Um, a few strategies I like to use with these nameplates, uh, at the end, of, we can use it as exit slips. And so if I'm teaching a unit at the end of every unit, um, students can write something that they learned that day. And it's kind of a journal, but just on that piece of paper um, of what they learned. So then at the end of the unit, they're able to go back and review all of that new learned information. And the exit slip two is just an informal, quick student assessment of what they learned. And it's really easy for us to see. So if I'm using my nameplates as exit slips, I collect them at the end of the class. And um, I can quickly just read and make sure students really comprehended the information I was teaching. Um, and then at the beginning of the next class, I have all of those students' names. So I lay them on the desk and students can collect their names and sit at their desk. And it's really easy for me to see who is absent. 
so it's a quick way for me to take attendance. If there are three students missing, I will know right away which three because their names will be on my desk. I love that. We got a question from uh, Walid in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, he's saying, what about classes that sometimes have more than 60 students? How do you learn everybody's name? You know, okay. what I do is I ask for two thirds of them to change their name <laughs> to the other one third. So I have to learn 20 names. That's right. That's oh. <laughs> Everyone has curious, what, what, what would you say to Walid? That's great. So the, the purpose of those uh, name plates is that if I do have 60 students, I will not be able to learn all of those students' names, but I can see their name, and so I can use that name in the classroom. Um, and just using names in the classroom, and if your student hears the teacher using your name, um, they're more likely to be active participate because they know the teacher knows your name. And whether you know it or not, uh, you can see the name with that name plate. I like it, thanks. Yeah. Um, so even if you have classes of 200, these are still useful where you can use names in the classroom. The second strategy, so the first one is nameplates. The second strategy is a classroom agreement. Who, what participants today have a set of class rules or classroom expectations? Um, if you just wanna enter in the chat box or the comment box, if you do or not, that would be great. Uh, making a classroom agreement is something I do on the first day of school. I like to let my students um, create the agreement. They can brainstorm, they can discuss and share together different expectations they have for their learning and what they expect to see in the classroom. However, I make sure um, that we work together and we all can agree on it. Let's look at this first list of the classroom agreement. Um, I have some different rules, some different expectations. So the first one, don't be late, don't use your cell phone, don't talk while other students are talking, don't be lazy, and don't turn in homework late. Um, John Mark, what do you notice about these particular rules? Well, they definitely all have in common that they start with a negative, don't. Yes. Which I don't know if students would respond very well to hearing that a lot. That's right, yeah. Yeah, notice that all these rules are what students cannot do in the classroom. The rules have a negative connotation or a negative aspect to them. And so when making a classroom agreement, I want to focus on the positive aspects of the classroom. And so as a teacher, if this is a list the students have given me, I would work together to um, rewrite these rules into a more positive setting. And so for example, instead of saying something like don't be late we can have our students say be on time or rather than don't use your cell phone keep your cell phone in your bag um, listen while other students are talking be an active learner and do your homework on time so we're taking those negative the not and the do not and the no's out of the classroom agreement and making it a little more positive um, so sharing these positive ones, students know what they can do. So for example, if I don't want students using their cell phone in class, I can just keep, and looking at the second rule, keep cell phone in your bag. Um, if I see cell phones on their desk and we're not using cell phones in that activity or whatever, I can just tell the student to place the cell phone in their bag rather than saying, no, no, no. Um, we just know where the cell phone goes. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of people that are responding to Good. the importance uh, of avoiding negative language of being positive. Yeah, yeah, and it's a really great way to start the class um, being positive and having positive expectations of your students as opposed to the negative expectations. Um, we have another question. Yeah. Um, this is a really good question. So you make this agreement. How can you guarantee that, they're, that they will buy into it? This is That's a question from Eason. Oh, Ethan, thank you for the question. Um, one thing I do to make sure that they buy in is that one, I have the students develop the expectation. So um, when it's student centered and student created, they can hold each other accountable. And it's not just teacher telling the students the rules. Um, and secondly, I always have my students sign the agreement. It makes it a little more official for them. So we have a signed agreement of um, expectations in the class. And yes, the teacher does have to uh, inform 
holds those rural students accountable when they do not uh, live up to those expectations. But I've also seen classrooms where students now start holding each other accountable because it was the student created agreement. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. So third um, activity that I do on the first day of school is a student questionnaire or a student survey. Um, and I've always found these to be just a really valuable resource for me as the teacher. Um, I usually pass out the student questionnaire on the first day of school just to gather a little more information about each of my students. I usually make them voluntary, um, but usually give students about five minutes at the end of class to complete. Um, or you can assign it as homework and take home whatever best fits the needs in your classroom for your learners. Um, however, I want to focus on question four. My student questionnaire, student surveys, I usually have four or five questions and they're usually just general information questions. However, specifically talking about question number four, question four is a chance for students to share important information with me that they may not otherwise have an opportunity to share. So this is a time where students can share information like they're having family troubles or maybe they're working three jobs and they're really busy. Um, they might have difficult uh, seeing and so they need to sit in the front of the classroom or difficulty hearing. Um, so as a teacher, this information is really important, but sometimes it's not always clearly communicated to us. So asking question number four, what is something that I should know about you? I'm allowing my students the opportunity to share that information. Um, if a student arrives to class late every day, I can know why. I know they're coming from their second job of the day and they're just exhausted. And um, instead of me, the teacher, getting frustrated that a student comes late every day, I know why and I can work with that student and maybe make a better time management plan. Um, so knowing this information on the first day of school, I'm able to have a more open mind towards my learner's ability. Um, I usually give a few examples of something I want to see. Um, and sometimes students don't really write anything, which is fine, but it's really helpful. Do any of the participants use a student questionnaire or student survey similar to this? Well, you know, so far we've gotten, um, so Elena says it's very useful and she's thanking us. So we ex probably should expect that Elena's students tomorrow will get something similar. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, there's um, a question from Hannah wanting to know if this is relevant for university students. Yeah, definitely. And this is usually where I use these and I found it most uh, beneficial because we don't always have that time to talk with university students and we don't know their prior learning background. Mm -hmm. um, and so I found this most beneficial with my university students, but definitely you can use it in the uh, secondary and elementary classrooms as well. Got it. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that they actually use these already. Great. Which I think is fantastic. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's so great that uh, teachers are using questionnaires to get to know their students, but then just uh, keeping in the back of your mind, including that fourth question uh, can be quite helpful. Right, and so just to be clear, this fourth question is just for the teacher. Just for the teacher, and I make it very clear that I don't share that information with anyone else, um, and it's just kept for me. Okay, all right, well, let's move along. I think we're running a little bit behind schedule. What's Great. next? So last thing uh, is establishing uh, a classroom routine and student responsibilities. I know a lot of you responded to this on our Facebook page and gave a lot of great answers. Some things you guys are already doing in your classroom are um, giving students more responsibility and um, even just passing out papers or cleaning the whiteboards, you know, having students take ownership in that classroom. Um, Lauren is going to share a Teacher's Corner article on classroom management in that comment box, which gives you really great uh, tips and strategies for building those classroom routines and strategies. So you can find that there. You can also find it on the American English um, state.gov webpage under the Teacher's Corner for more of that information. Classroom management is such a broad concept, and so it can include so many different topics. Um, but definitely talking about communication in the classroom and lesson and classroom layout, uh, which is an important part of the uh, community in your classroom. So who takes responsibility for that? 
Are there any questions on the classroom routines from the comment box there? I don't think they're coming in. Great. So let's move on to the next slide here. Quickly review the four strategies I use on that first day of school. I use nameplates and I use them every day of the year, all year long, um, making a classroom agreement and making sure that you keep that classroom agreement positive. Um, number three, providing students with that student questionnaire, including that qu question number four, and then also establishing some classroom routines in your classroom. So those are four things you can do on your very first day of school um, or in that first week. Um, moving on, I'm going to share five different activities that you can use throughout the whole year um, to continue establishing that classroom community and building those relationships in your classroom. Um, those five activities are all about me, two truths and a lie, would you rather, quiz quiz trade, um, and finally memory maker. Mm. And so also as I'm sharing these activities, um, teachers, I want you to think about maybe some activities that you use in your classroom and you can share those in the comment box as well um, of what you do in your classroom to connect your students. So this first activity, All About Me, this is a great uh, activity to introduce public speaking to your students. Um, it's, it's a simple activity. As a teacher, I would present first, and I would just use a, any kind of bag, like the brown paper bag in the bottom of the left-hand corner. And I ask my students to think of three or five objects that best represent who they are or things they like, some of their hobbies and interests just so we can get to know each other a little bit better in the classroom. Um, so for example, in my bag, I would place jigsaw puzzle pieces, a book, swim goggles, and a passport. And then I would stand in front of the classroom and explain how each piece represents me. So I love to travel, which is why I would include my passport. I love swimming, why I included goggles. Um, and then it provides students the opportunity to ask follow-up questions. So how long have you been swimming? Where do you travel? Um, what is the biggest puzzle piece or puzzle you've ever finished? And so um, this activity is great for students. Um, they're standing in front of the classroom for the first time, talking to their students, um, and they're talking about themselves and things they like so that uh, they're maybe a little more confident, less nervous. We're lowering that effective filter. So we're making them more confident in the classroom. Um, John Mark, if you had an All About Me bag, what, what kind of items would you put in there? Oh my goodness, in my All About Me bag, um, I would probably put um, my uh, running shoes because I like to run. Great. Um, and I would put a uh, guitar pick because I'm a musician. And uh, I like to read also, so I would put a book. I think Perfect. the most important thing I would include in my all about me bag is uh, pizza because I like to eat pizza. Yeah, that's great. And then I can bring the bag <laughs> and have a snack. See? <laughs> you can eat your pizza while you explain your uh, objects exactly. in your bag. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so if I have a very large classroom again, like 60 students, I would usually do this in small group work, which unfortunately not everyone will get to see everyone's bag but you're developing, you're starting to establish and develop those relationships in the classroom. So students are starting to learn each other. Yeah. Um, and of course, the first thing, of course, they say their name, introduce themselves and then find commonality. So maybe if someone had a drumstick in their bag, you and um, the student can connect over music. Right? Oh, not a chicken drumstick. No. Nope. <laughs> um, so we're getting a couple of comments. One teacher, uh, Valentina says she uses an activity called random fact. So she asks her students to give the classroom a random fact about themselves, Good. which um, is kind of like all about me. Yeah. Right? And then another, another teacher, uh, Irina, says, that, says she uses a game called My Favorite, and the students okay. choose a different category, like a city's hobby, hobbies, weather, or, or something else, and they speak about their favorite things, which uh, to her and to me also sounds similar to all about me. That's great, yeah. And I love that we're sharing these ideas and. Um, having more activities that we can try. So keep, uh, keep sharing the ideas of what you're already doing in your classroom. That's great, thank you. Uh, let's move to the second one, True Truths and a Lie. This is a very common American game or activity in the classroom. 
um, not as common internationally when I was living in Southeast Asia, but my students really responded well to it. Um, for two truths and a lie, students tell two truthful sentences and one sentence that is a lie. So again, the students are talking about themselves, but they get to be creative and come up with a sentence that is not true. So for example, John Mark, I have two younger sisters, I speak mm -hmm. French, and I have been to China. Which sentence is false? So this is about you. This is about me. My job is to guess which one is false. I That's would correct. say that it's that you don't have two younger sisters. I do have two younger sisters, ah. but I do not speak French. So the yeah. I speak French is a not true sentence. It is false. So that is the lie. Are you <laughs> sure that you don't speak French? <laughs> I'm sure. I wish I could. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is a get to know you icebreaker that I do at the beginning of the year uh, for students just to start building those connections. Um, but it can also be modified to meet different um, classroom lessons that you're using. So if I'm teaching a grammar course, um, if we go to the next slide, you can see if I'm teaching a grammar course, I might tell the students to write two truths and a lie. However, they have to use a specific verb tense. So if we want to go to the next slide, yeah. So for example, um, I have traveled to Singapore, I've lived in Laos, and I will go to Germany in March. Those are three sentences about travel. I used three different verb tenses. You can have the students write a specific verb tense, you can mix verb tenses, um, but they're just writing sentences and then they get to speak those sentences. So they're communicating that language that we're teaching in the classroom um, about a specific topic or a specific grammar tense. Of those three sentences, which is a, which is a lie? John Mark, um, what do you think? I think that you are lying when you say that you will go to Germany in March. Yes, that is correct. I will mm -hmm. not go to Germany in March. Mm -hmm. I wish I could. <laughs> right. Um, but I have, I lived in Laos and I have traveled to Singapore. And then you could follow up with more questions in student conversation. This is a good activity if you have a few minutes at the end of class that you want to fill, um, a few minutes at the beginning to warm up. It's, it's good. Uh, maybe to use a few times throughout the semester or the quarter um, when you're working with your students. So Great. Wait, well, how would you try it on me? Okay, let's see. Yeah, let's three, two truths and a lie. Okay, Maybe. first of all, I hope that my mother's not watching because <laughs> she saw me telling a lie to oh, our many no. thousands of viewers. Um, <laughs> she would be very upset. So nobody tell her. Okay. okay. We'll keep uh, it so two truths and a lie. Okay, number one, um, I... I have lived in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. Number okay. two, I I speak Russian. Okay. And number three, I uh, I have been president of the United States. Oh, I think I know what the lie is. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't think you've been president of the United States. Really? Yeah. Well, you're right. You're right. You I... caught me. <laughs> right. And so the the point of this is just to get your students talking, sharing information, getting to know each other. Um, and they get to be creative in telling the lie and then correcting the students and sharing which sentence is false there. Great. Would you rather is another similar activity. It's an activity for students to practice that conditional grammar structure, but essentially it's forming a question. Would you rather and giving the students two options. They must decide between um, you can see in that top right corner, I have a jar of popsicle sticks. Mm -hmm. And so I like to write um, different questions, would you rather questions, so I can just pick one out, ask the students, or they can ask each other. So you so write for, the questions on the popsicle sticks? I write the questions on the popsicle sticks. And then I have that set for the whole year. So we can um, ask questions. Again, if I have a few minutes at the end of class or a few minutes in the beginning, waiting for students coming in, um, it's a good conversation starter, getting students using the language and communicating. Did you so, have to eat all of those popsicles yourself to get the sticks? I did, every one of them. Wow, that sounds like fun. <laughs> it was great. Um, you can also buy popsicle sticks, and you can also oh, use just uh, paper or a flashcard or three by five paper um, and write questions as well, but using a different uh, tactile object is nice for the students to get to use as well. Um, so, for example, would you rather, John Mark, would you rather read a book or watch a movie? 
okay, well, I, I, I assume that my mother's not watching, so I'm going to say I would rather watch a movie. Right. But um, I, I know that I should probably say that I would rather read a book. <laughs> well, if we're watching the movie in English, we're practicing those English language uh, That's right. skills. What yeah. if we watched a movie about somebody reading a book? Oh, that would, there we go. See, then we get both. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then uh, there's another example here. Um, would you rather do all your friends' laundry for a year or wash all of your friends' dishes? Hmm. Um, I don't know what kind of friend would ask me to do this. So it would probably be the end of the friendship, but it's, <laughs> I, I can't stand doing laundry. Okay. I would say I would rather wash my friend's dishes for a, for a year. All right. So we're giving our students an opportunity to be pretty creative here because we'll let them create their own questions um, that they get to ask their students. And once they've played a few rounds of this activity, um, they get the idea and they can develop their own questions like that. Have any of our participants viewing today, have has anyone here played Would You Rather or something similar? Uh, most definitely, but we, got a, we did get a question from Cecilia who, who wants to know how these can be adapted for younger learners or lower level learners. Good. Um, for lower level learners, I would just start with the phrase Would You Rather and then the idea is you're giving two options. So you could start if you're introducing verbs. Would you rather run or swim? And students can decide between the two objects. Mm. Would you rather um, stand or sit? Right. So doing different uh, verbs in the classroom. Right. That you're introducing. And you can even, you know, say run or swim. Exactly. Right. We can show right. those actions. Yeah. We can have all of the students stand and um, move to either side of the classroom. So if you would rather run, go to the left side of the room. If you would rather swim, go to the right side of the room. Mm -hmm. And then you can see right there who you have in common um, or what you have in common with other classmates. Well, um, it also looks like Cecilia is getting a lot of ideas from uh, her fellow participants in the chat. So that's fantastic. Great, that's great. And one other resource I wanna share is the AE Activate page. Um, and it's called, Would You Rather, Have You Ever, Oh When? Um, and you can see an example of the board game, which is online on the American English website that you can print for free. And there are many, many resources. This is just one of many um, where you can use uh, an activity such as this. Excellent. Great. Okay. Quiz, quiz, trade. This is one of my favorite activities in the classroom because there are so many great modifications. Um, and at first, it's a little organized chaos. It's kind of chaotic for the students to understand, but once they understand how to do this activity, it's a really quick, great way to review a lesson um, at the beginning of class or just recently learned content. So if, John Mark, you and I are in class together, um, okay. All, I have all of my students write one question. Mm -hmm. And usually, I should say, the first time I do this activity, I write all of the questions and I give each student a question. So the first time I do this, it's going to be basic get to know you information. What is your favorite book? Who is your hero? Um, where do you live? Basic questions that is easy for the students to answer. Okay. So everyone has one question and then they find a partner. So John Mark, you would be my partner, okay. and I would read you my question. And we have different questions, right? They're all different. Everyone has different questions. All right. Um, and so if I read you my question, you would answer, and then you would read me your question, and I would answer. Got it, got so it. I, so that would take less than a minute, maybe 30 seconds, and then you and I are going to switch questions. So now we each have new questions. And with those new questions, you're gonna find a new partner. Um, okay. So if we go to the next slide, we can kind of see a visual. Um, mm -hmm. so whatever question you just answered, you will ask. So okay. for example, here's a diagram of just six students, A, B, C, D, E, F, um, and each colored square represents a different question. So we start, Person A asks question B, person B their question, and then person B asks student A their question, 
And now in the next diagram, you can see they've switched. So now person A has the yellow card, where person B has the red card, but a new partner. So quiz, quiz, trade. So we ask a question, we answer a question, we trade cards, and then we find a new partner. And so then now you can see person A again, they have the purple card that they're asking, but they're answering the green card. I love it. So um, Mir Abdullah has a question. Okay. So for quiz, quiz, trade, should students move around the classroom? Yes. And is also, is it applicable to like large heterogeneous classrooms? Because I can imagine if we have 60 students playing quiz, quiz, trade, that our neighbors across the hall might not uh, be able to hear themselves. Is that okay? I would always uh, recommend being respectful to the other teachers and students around your classrooms. Um, I have on a nice day, I'll take my students outside and we'll do this activity at the end of class before they leave for the day. So if I have 60 students, this is still a great activity that you can use with them. All students write a question. So now you have 60 questions that students are practicing their English with and then they're answering um, 60 questions. So if I give my students 10 minutes, I say find as many uh, students as you can talk with. Or maybe I'll say, talk with seven students. So they're asking and answering seven questions. Great. Um, so to start this activity, I'll use basic get to know you information. But as I continue teaching, I focus the questions on learned content. So what did we learn? Can you write a question um, about something that we learned? And that shows really advanced learning skills, English language skills, when they're able to form questions in English about content they learned. Okay. And we have one last question we can answer very quickly. Okay. Um, uh, so, Mir Abdullah was a follow up. What is the teacher's role when students do quiz, quiz, trade? Uh, I know the answer. Let's go get a cup of coffee, right? That's exactly right. No. So, for <laughs> quiz, quiz, trade to work effectively, you have to have an even number of students. So, anytime I have an odd number of students, I participate. Um, so that I can, as students ask, ask, trade, they're constantly moving and finding new partners. Um, otherwise, if I already have an even number of students I observe, or this is giving me an opportunity to prepare or set up for the next activity in class. Great. Well, speaking of the next activity, let's move on. Yeah. So this last activity I love to do on the first day, I'm sorry, the very, very last day of class, it is called Memory Maker. And this is a last day of class activity. Um, as a teacher for a long time, I kind of struggled on how to conclude my class or how to finish it. I wanted students to leave not just concerned about the final exam or all of the studying or homework, or I wanted them to leave my class on a positive note with positive feelings. Um, so in my experience, um, I, not knowing what to do, I found this to be really effective. So going back to those no name plates, um, we use the nameplates again, and students open their nameplate, um, so it's a blank sheet of paper. So it's a blank sheet of paper, and I have students write comments on the inside of the nameplate. So students are writing positive notes to each other um, about something they did that was great that year. So if I have a class of 24 students, that student will leave with comments from each student sharing the great things that that student did in class. So for example, some uh, possible remarks that I've seen students write was, thank you for always being the first to participate in class. Uh, you had great ideas during our group project. Thanks for helping me study. Um, you're always so positive. Thanks for always smiling. Um, maybe they would write a quick little story that, some, that a student did that was really funny or really inspiring and motivating in the classroom. Um, so it's kind of like a little mini yearbook that students can take from the class of all of the positive things that had happened. Super. Great. Any, does any, do any other teachers want to share in the comments a last day of class activity they like to do with their students? Um, feel free to do that. I found this just to be you know, students are leaving the classroom with a smile on their face, reading positive messages from all of their classmates. Um, and of course, as a teacher, I'm writing comments as well, 
thanking the students for their hard work and participation. Well, we have one uh, comment that is uh, a, an idea to ask students to decorate their memory maker. I love that idea. And I do, if I'm uh, using many nameplates throughout the years, I like uh, throughout the uh, year, I like students to decorate it and show that artistic side um, and decorate their name how they, how they want to, as long as I can read it. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. So just to recap these last five activities I like to implement, um, we have All About Me, Two Truths and a Lie, Would You Rather, um, Quiz Quiz Trade, and Memory Maker. So those are five activities I like to use. Memory Maker I use on the last day of class. All About Me I use um, towards the beginning of the year. And the other three activities I use throughout the, the year um, as often as I find necessary or possible. Um, great. Super. Wow, yeah. Mari, thank you so very much. That thank was wonderful. I, I really got Excellent. a lot out of it. And I, I, I can so. tell in the, in the chats that a lot <laughs> of our participants um, got a lot. I envision many, many numbers of students doing these activities very, very soon in their own classrooms. Uh, That's so thank so you very, great. very much. Yeah, and I um, want to thank all the participants from joining in. I know it, that we are all in different time zones, and so um, being able to participate in this teacher development is so great. And I hope we can continue these comments, sharing activities that you're doing, and letting us know if you used any of the classroom, um, any of these activities in your classroom. I'd love to see photos of that. Um, before I finish today, I just want to leave you with this uh, quote that I love. A person who feels appreciated will always do more than expected. So when we can show appreciation towards our students and they can show appreciation towards us as teachers, um, we have established that stronger classroom community um, and developed those relationships and your students can surprise you and they really will when you show that appreciation towards them. That's great. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, so 